All right. So for tonight, the, uh, some things that you're going to need. Number one, obviously, you're going to need a Windows or a Mac computer. I had uh, some people in the group chat talking about how they have Linux computers. Um, again, you can use Linux uh, through a backdoor software application. However, we don't recommend this. It's not the most up-to-date WeChat dev tools. Uh, instead, use Windows or Mac. You need to turn your VPN off. Make sure it is off. We're going to be using local Chinese tools as well as local Chinese websites, so you do not need a VPN. The third thing, as Renee has sent into the group, please open up this website here, build a real-time data tracker website guide. This guide is going to be helping you throughout the workshop to um, basically guide you through the different challenges that we're going to be providing you. So when you're coding by yourself, you can have a little bit of help. All right, so open this up. I have it already opened up here. This is what it's going to look like, okay? And then the fourth thing is that you want to download the WeChat Development Toolkit. Now, I'm sure that a lot of you have already done this, and there were some questions in the group as to how to do this properly. Um, but if we go through this process, if I click on this link, it'll open up our... Um, this is, looks like to be our WeChat mini program developer documentation. So here we have three choices. I have a Windows 64 download, I have a Windows 32 download, or a Mac OS download. So this all depends on the machine that you're using tonight. If you're going to be using a Windows 64 Git or above, use Windows 64. If it's a lower power, if it's a less pow powerful machine, then Windows 32 is fine. If you're using a MacBook, MacBook Pro, then you want to use Mac OS, all right? So make sure that you're downloading that. It takes about five minutes to download, so make sure you're doing that now before we get started. Um, some also questions in the group chat about whether or not the video on Tim Lau is working or not. Sometimes you need to uh, refresh the page in order for it to work well, all right? Um, I'm also going to increase this just a little bit more so everybody can hear. Okay, great. So moving on, just some questions and courtesy for tonight. Uh, this PowerPoint will be available after the live stream if you help us by submitting feedback. Uh, we'll get to that a little bit later tonight. The second thing is that if you have any questions, please ask them both on the channel platform or the WeChat. Both are okay. Renee Tong, our teaching assistant tonight, is going to be helping to answer those questions. And if I feel the question is pertinent enough for the entire group to know, then I'll also uh, raise it here during the live stream. Um, number three, obviously, you know, be an adult. This is, this is something very simple for everybody to understand. Please no using profanity. Please no using any um, insensitive uh, commentary in the group chat. All right, we're all looking forward to learning together today. Now, just to give a brief introduction to myself, I am Alex Smith. I'm the Luwagen of uh, Shenzhen. I'm, I'm sorry, I am the driver of Luwagen Shenzhen, also the general manager. Uh, I'm also the JavaScript instructor here for our programs. Uh, I have been a WeChat mini program developer since the summer of 2018, where I joined the Luwagen web development program myself. All right, so going on to today's schedule, uh, the first thing that we're going to be talking about is a little bit of introduction to Luwagen and who we are uh, as we are organizing this workshop tonight. The second thing is we're going to do a quick introduction to WeChat mini programs. That's WXMP, Weixin mini programs. The third thing we'll do is we'll set up your project. So I see a lot of you have already set up your project and set up your dev tools. So we're going to be helping you along that process and importing a template which we have already created for you. Number four, we're going to be introducing some web languages. Now, if you uh, went to our or attended our last workshop online, we talked about WXML and WXSS, and we even built our own landing pages using a WeChat mini program. Now, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about WXML and WXSS, but more so, we're going to be talking about what we didn't talk about last time, which is JavaScript. Now, if you're wondering, oh no, I didn't go to the last workshop, am I going to be missing out? No, don't worry, this workshop has been designed specifically for people that have had no coding experience in the past, even if you didn't attend our last workshop, all right? Finally, number five, we're going to be introducing you guys to JavaScript and what this coding language is. Number six, we're going to do an introduction to APIs. Seven, finally, we're going to talk about data binding, especially within the WeChat mini program framework. 
And then finally, number eight, we're gonna talk a little bit about what's next. What you can do as a developer to continue building on your application. And if you're interested in studying more about coding and more about WeChat mini programs, what are some resources for you? All right, so let's look a little bit into today's outcome. So we are going to build something very similar to this. Uh, we're gonna have a customizable style for you. Your background can change, your, your, the content on the title can change, the logo can change. So if you're looking at this and you're like, ooh, I don't really like that style very well, don't worry, you can customize that later. Uh, these are gonna be real-time numbers that you're seeing on the right. So we talked about building a COVID, uh, coronavirus, um, the, the most recent numbers that are coming out. Um, so we're gonna be using an API to communicate or we're gonna be communicating with an API and then receiving that information from that API. Uh, and then we're also gonna have navigation across pages. I know that some of you last workshop were trying to figure out how do I get from my first page to my second page. Uh, we're gonna be talking about that basically right off the bat. All right, so again, customizable style. We're gonna have some real-time numbers on data, uh, which is important for us and for our users. And then we're gonna have some API communication and of course navigation across those pages. Great, so the outline for tonight, how it's all gonna work, basically what will happen is I will talk about some concepts for you guys to understand. I will do some coding and I'll show you exactly how uh, we do the code inside the WeChat developers tool. And then finally, I'm gonna give you about five minutes each time to code by yourself, all right? During this time, I'll be in the group chat, Renee will be in the group chat. If you have any questions regarding your own code or regarding any errors that you might be running into, this is the time to ask them, all right? So we ask you that during the time that I'm speaking and I'm doing my live code demo, please don't code. Uh, this is best because if I am coding and you're coding at the same time, you might miss something. So uh, make sure you're listening during this time and then when we give you time to do some coding, you go ahead and do that, all right? So. Let's talk quickly about introduction to Low Wagon. All right, so um, very briefly, Low Wagon is an international coding bootcamp. We have um, programs across 39 cities around the world. We have already graduated nearly 7,000 alumni from these programs. Um, and from these programs, we've also launched nearly 100 startups. Okay, so if you're interested in learning a bit more about our company globally, feel free to check out our website, lowagon.com. Um, some of our main programs that we teach to our students are our full-time web development program, where within nine weeks we teach you from absolutely zero, where you know nothing about coding, nothing about technology, to at the ninth week where you're able to build a fully functional um, so, um, web application. This includes both the back end and the front end. Basically from the design, from the thought of what is this application through to the development of your back end and your database, due to the front end and the user interface that you'll be, the user will actually be using. Secondly, we have a part-time product development program. This program is meant for those people who have full-time jobs who are not able to bring themselves outside of those jobs, but still want to learn more about tech. Now, this program runs on Tuesdays and Thursdays nights, as well as on Saturday throughout the day. So you don't have to quit your current job or you don't have to leave your current situation in order to enroll. This program is mainly uh, geared towards product development and more front-end product development. Um, and we use WeChat mini programs as a way of uh, explaining JavaScript frameworks and a way of um, experimenting and testing out how to actually build digital products. Uh, a lot of times we have people asking us about learning outcomes. If you guys are interested in knowing more about what our students are doing after the program, feel free to check out this awesome blog article. Uh, and if you're interested in coming to Shenzhen and learning more with us, feel free to scan some of these QR codes, understand a bit more about the programs that we're running, um, or just have a conversation with myself or Renee after uh, the workshop tonight. All right, um, we're located at Ranzian Chanya GD. This is the software industry base, uh, building four and the uh, building four B in one piece work. If you don't know, it's a um, it's also an international. Um, co-working space, similar to a WeWork. 
But in this co-working space, um, we are located, so feel free to come by, grab a coffee, talk to us a little bit more about what you do and what you want from us. All right, so in this next section, we're gonna talk a little bit about WeChat mini programs. All right, so um, if you haven't already known what a WeChat mini program is, if you've been living under a rock, uh, these things are pretty big and pretty popular. Um, these are, this is data as of July of 2019, so we are about eight months ahead of this data, which means that these numbers that you see here have only grown since. But uh, from July 2019, there have been 2.3 million WeChat mini programs already in the market. There have been over 280 million daily active users of those WeChat mini programs, and over 700 million people who are monthly active are monthly active users, basically users that are using WeChat mini programs at least once a month. All right. So um, especially during this time, uh, I know that a lot of us have been staying indoors. A lot of us have been infected by the situation with the virus recently and with health concerns. Um, WeChat mini programs have been a very big part of a lot of our lives. Um, I've given a couple of examples of different WeChat mini programs which are helping to assist the public um, doing various number of things. So the one to the far left, as you can see, it's for purchasing face masks. If you take your phone, use your WeChat, scan it, it'll open up the WeChat mini program, you can check it out for yourself. But different WeChat mini programs are being used to purchase face masks, which I know have been in very short supply recently. Um, this one on the bottom here, you can check travel history. So if you've ridden on a train recently or have taken a flight recently, you can actually check whether or not this train or this flight had an infected passenger on it. So if you wanted to find ways to make yourself even more paranoid, this is a good way of doing it. Um, you can also check your surrounding area. I know one of our team members um, brought this up to us recently. So you can see within your local city or local area um, who has been affected. So WeChat mini programs have been a really big part of this entire epidemic um, over the past three weeks. And so today we're going to be understanding a bit better about how these WeChat mini programs work. So um, what are mini programs? Development wise, mini programs can do about 80% of what native applications can do. And when we're talking about native applications, we're talking about iOS applications. So these are iOS applications that you can find on your phone, similar like what WeChat might be, um, or even an Android application. These are quote unquote native applications. So mini programs can do about 80% of what these native apps can do with about only 20% of the development effort. And a large part of this is because WeChat provides us developers with tons and tons of ready built code. Um, so things, if we go to the next slide, we can actually better understand about what this ready-made code is. Um, so for an example, let's look at user location on the top. Um, so if I were building an iOS application and I wanted to get my user's location, then I might have to use a third party mapping system in order to do that. But because WeChat mini program is already built with WeChat or Tencent's mapping system, I don't have to do that. I can just easily call a local API in order to get that user's location. Um, moving down, I can also get that user's WeChat data. So for example, login. If I want the user to log in to their, their username or authenticate them when they go onto my mini program, I can do that very easily with WeChat. We've all seen this before as we've gone onto a WeChat and then it asks us for our information and we can either authorize or deny. Um, there are other things, of course, like WeChat Pay where you can uh, have a user pay for any sort of product directly on the WeChat mini program, um, as well as more device related. So I can also see, um, I can also help them to make a call. I can also see what direction they're facing with the compass. These built in functionality that WeChat mini programs gives us makes it much easier for us as developers to develop products that we think are useful for the public. All right. And so today during our lecture and during the workshop, we are also going to be um, diving into some of these different um, WeChat local APIs, okay? So technically, what is a WeChat mini program? Um, if you've ever built a website or ever had any interaction with a web application before, then this might look pretty familiar. 
um, because a WeChat mini program in general is really just a website. Um, you have a, if you look at the, let's look at the framework uh, in that box here. You have two parts, you have a view layer on the left and then you have a logic layer on the right. So that view layer on the left is mainly built of two different uh, technologies or languages, which is HTML and CSS. Now this is the user interface. This is, if I'm actually looking at a WeChat mini program, this is what I see on the screen. It's the fonts, it's the colors, it's the words. This is the content, this is what I'm looking at. This is the view layer. Uh, and behind that is what we call the logic layer. So this is made up of JavaScript. And what happens is, is as I as a user interact with my view layer, say I push a button, or say I scroll down the page, then that will call different functions in my logic layer. So my logic layer will then do something uh, reactively to the user on the view layer, right? So last workshop, we discussed uh, very thoroughly the view layer and looked, about, looked into HTML and CSS. Um, however, we didn't touch the logic layer. Today, we're gonna be mostly working with that logical layer. Now, there are other parts to a WeChat mini program as well. Um, the first are third-party APIs, which you see on the far right, which are HTTPS requests. Now, uh, this is what we're going to be working with today, and we're going to be talking about a little bit deeper about APIs. What is an API? Okay. Uh, and then on the left, you see here Tencent, they have a mini programs repository. So what is this? Um, this can basically be summed up as um, a large cloud database where all of the WeChat mini programs are developed and published onto Tencent uh, where they're stored. So as a user, I would say scan a QR code for a WeChat mini program or I, on my recently used WeChat mini programs, I click on a logo. What happens is my phone, my device, sends a request to the mini programs repository, this cloud database. And then it requests that specific mini program, which then Tencent will then respond with. Okay, so it's a similar situation as a website request, right? So it's, it's nothing really out of the ordinary and it's not magic. And today we're going to be diving a bit deeper into kind of the nerdiness of all of this. So I hope you guys are excited. Um, so diving a little bit more into market research for WeChat mini programs. Uh, one of the big problems that I think a lot of people who are interested in building WeChat mini programs have is that they don't know what's currently out on the market. Um, WeChat mini programs, unlike iOS applications or Android applications, doesn't have a, a mini program store. So you can't see what are the most trending WeChat mini programs. You can't see by category what these mini programs are uh, because there's nothing like that that Tencent provides. So instead, what we need to do is we need to rely on third party systems and third party organizers to take all this information about what are these different WeChat mini programs on the market today and then provide them to us. So just as an example, let's, let's take a look at minapp.com. Um, minapp is, is one of the leaders in um, WeChat mini program news and, and, and the different mini programs that are out there on the market today. So I'm on the front page right here. And if I look down, I can see some um, basically recommended mini programs for me. So this is where I found some of the uh, NCOV related programs. Um, so if I wanted to click on this one, for example, I can see a brief description about what this mini program is as well as some views of what it looks like. And I also have the QR code that I can tap into it. So if you're looking to build a WeChat mini program, but first want to do a bit of market research, feel free to jump on this site, minapp.com, to, to better understand what's currently out there, all right? Then what we wanna do is we wanna understand the process of creating a WeChat mini program. Uh, unlike building a website, it's not just, you know, I, I write a piece of code, I grab a domain name, um, I find a, a serving platform, and I publish it. Um, it's actually more closely related to an Apple iOS application where it needs to go through a certification process. So what you need to do first is you need to register uh, for a WeChat mini program. And so this can be done here at this link. Uh, it'll bring you to the site which has both English and Chinese translation if you're interested. Um, but you'll need to register your mini program first. This generally takes an email as well as a Chinese citizen ID. The second thing you'll do is you'll actually code your WeChat mini program. 
um, which we're going to be doing today. Uh, the third thing is you need to certify. So you, the certification process is basically Tencent, making sure that you are who you say you are. Um, and, and I would say the reason for this is, is that they want to make sure that, that someone's liable. If somebody puts um, a sensitive WeChat mini program on the market, whether it be because it has pornographic material or politically insensitive information, then they don't want that. So they want to make sure that um, you as a user are, are being responsible with uh, what you're putting into the market. All right, and then finally, uh, you have review and release. So review is where I submit my code to Tencent, who will look over my mini program and make sure everything is up to standard. And if they pass that review, then I can release it finally to the market. All right, so there's a process that you have to go through in order to actually build a mini program and publish it to the market. Now, for our purposes today, we are not going to be registering a WeChat mini program or going through the certification process because this takes potentially two to three days. Um, instead, what we're going to be using is we're going to be using a test account. So there's no WeChat mini program registration attached to our code that we're building, and we're not going to be able to publish it right away into the market. Um, we're just going to be building WeChat mini programs locally on my, our machine. So after this, you can take a screenshot on your phone of your WeChat mini program, but unfortunately you can't share with friends. If you want to build a WeChat mini program that you can then share with your friends and share with your community, you have to go through the registration process. All right. Um, finally, when we are getting ready to build our WeChat mini program, we want to make sure that we have all the information we need to succeed. Um, and that is really, a big part of this comes with the WeChat mini program developer docs. So here I'm going to open up this link and it's going to bring us to our developers documentation. So uh, we're going to be using this quite a lot tonight. So I want to make sure that everybody has this open as a tab in their page. Um, first thing that I want everybody to notice is that there are two settings. You can either look at this in Chinese or in English. Um, I'm going to be using English because this course is going to be in English tonight. Um, and you can see here that it has a lot of information about building WeChat mini programs themselves. So we're just going to keep this tab open for now uh, and make sure that it's working. Uh, and then finally, the last thing that we want to talk about with WeChat mini programs is that um, you are in a, we like to use the metaphor of a walled garden. As a developer for WeChat mini programs, you're developing within a walled garden. This is not an, an open, um, this is not an open environment where you can do whatever you want. There are rules that you must follow in order to have your WeChat mini program uh, published into the market. So as you go about developing, please keep this in mind. Um, although it's a walled garden, there are a lot of users, as we saw from the data earlier, um, over 700 million monthly active users that are readily um, available to use your WeChat mini program. So if you play by the rules and you stay within this walled garden, um, there is a lot to gain. So just keep that in mind. The next thing we're going to talk about is setting up your project. So, so setting up your project, what does this mean? Um, the first thing we're going to be doing is we're going to be downloading a boilerplate. So what is a boilerplate? A boilerplate is basically a template that we have already built that we want you to use tonight as you go about tonight's lecture. All right, so um, I've downloaded it here. It just finished downloading. I'm gonna take this and drag it onto, oops. I want to drag it on my desktop, but I have to minimize this first. Apologies for that. Okay, this is my desktop, beautiful background image. I'm gonna take the zip file that I just downloaded and I'm gonna paste it right here on my desktop. Um, the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna open it. So opening this zip file, I have my folder here. So if I open this folder, it has uh, one folder and a few files. We're not gonna to touch those right now. We're just gonna leave that on the desktop. All right. The second thing we're gonna do is we're going to be importing our project. Now, um, if you've already have your WeChat mini program developers tools ready to go, um, it should look something like this on our left, all right? So you should have a, before you have this screen on the left, 
you're going to have a QR code that pops up. What you want to do is you want to use your WeChat to scan that QR code. This is logging your specific WeChat into this mini program developer's tool. All right, so this is going to link your WeChat with this tool, which is going to be helpful for us later. So make sure you do that. And once you've done that, you'll have this screen on the left. Now, on the screen on the left, there is a large gray square with a gray plus sign in the middle. We're going to be pressing that, which is going to be adding a new WeChat mini program to our current library. Now, as we've done that, you see here on the right, on the top, there is a tab which says Import Project. Because we're not going to be starting with a new project today, we're going to be starting with what's called a boilerplate. We're going to be pressing this Import Project tab. Uh, in the directory, which is the second row down, the second item, we're going to click that and we're going to choose the folder that we just brought onto our desktop. All right. The, the last thing is you see there's an app ID underneath of this directory. That app ID should automatically appear. If for some reason that app ID does not appear, you can press this use test account option on the bottom. All right. So once you've done that, uh, you have your project imported. The product name is COVID-19 Data Tracker. The directory is correct. Your app ID is correctly inputted. Then please press the import, okay? And then you'll be in. And then we'll do this uh, a quick look around. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to close the slides and I'm going to show you how to exactly do this using the WeChat mini program dev tools. All right, so I'm on my desktop here and I'm going to open up my WeChat uh, mini program dev tools. So that's at here in the bottom. WeChat dev tools. And it's going to open up this page. So um, what I want to do again is I want to click this add new project. And then instead of creating a new project, I want to press import project. And then where am I going to be importing my project from? Um, I'm going to go to this line directory. I'm going to click on this green button. And you see here on my desktop, I have this 200225, which is today's date, um, login data tracker. So once I've clicked on that, um, I can also, I'm pressing select. What I can also do is I can just click on it like this and then press select. That works as well. And what you'll see is that once I press select, my directory changes to the correct path of that folder and my project name also changes. Um, you'll also see the app ID automatically is imported. So that looks great. I'm not going to change anything. Now I'm just going to press import and then WeChat mini program dev tools is going to be creating my project. All right, so uh, we should be good. As you can see, my project has been built. And now on the left here, I can see the beginnings of my WeChat mini program. Um, so what we want to do now is I'm just going to uh, provide you guys a brief tour of our WeChat dev tools here. So you guys have an understanding of what we're looking at. Um, one of the first things that I want to show you is that, uh, and a couple questions that we had earlier, is under settings, if you go to general settings, um, you'll see a couple different things. Number one, you'll see that you can change the language to be either Chinese, English, or whatever your system language is. I think, I think currently they only support Chinese and English, but for our purposes today, I'm going to be using English. Okay. Then the next thing is you can see under appearance, I can choose either a light theme or I can choose a dark theme. All right. And so uh, I'm going to be using a dark theme just because it's easier on my eyes. And um, if you know, light themes are just a little bit too crazy. Um, so once I have my settings clear, once I have my language right, uh, we can take you on a brief tour of the different components that comprise this dev tool. First thing that you can see here on the left is this is our simulator. So what this is going to do is it's going to show us in real time how our mini program is going to look based on our code. All right. So as we change our code, on the right, which we'll show you a little bit later, um, our mini program here on the left will change. Okay, so a couple cool things about this simulator is number one, you can change the phone that the simulator is simulating. So I can change it to a smaller phone, like an iPhone 5. And as it gets smaller, you can see that the design changes a bit, the screen changes size. 
Um, I can even change it to like a Nexus 5X, for example, a much wider phone. So why is this helpful? Well, for us developers, we know that a lot of our users are using different styles of phones. So if we're using different styles of phones, we wanna make sure that our mini programs look good for all of our users. So we need to change style to make sure that that fits correctly. Um, my personal preference is using an iPhone X. Um, another thing you can do is you can change the size of this screen as well. You can change it to be much bigger, 100%, but unfortunately if you do that, you can't see the whole phone. So we're gonna change that to 75, and that fits about right. The second thing we're gonna be looking at is right here, this column. Um, what this is, is this is our file system, or our file directory. So you see here, there's a pages folder, there's an app.js file, there's an app.json file, and so on and so forth. Now, what you're looking at here is actually exactly what we have here in our folder. A pages folder, a app.js file, app.json file. Um, so this file system here is just an exact replica of this. It's just another interpretation of it. All right, so, um, so this is our file system, and we're gonna be working within this file system a little bit later today, okay? Um, the third thing that I want everybody to see is our text editor, which is gonna be here on our right. So our text editor is where we're gonna be actually editing our code. So if I open up a specific code file, so for example, this index.wxml, um, I can see my code on the right here. And you'll see here that I have this header with content COVID-19, which is right here, and then real-time data tracker. So these are different WXML elements. If you took our workshop last week or two weeks ago, then this will look pretty familiar to you. Um, just to give an example of how if I change the code in my editor here, then on the left side, uh, it's also gonna change with my simulator. So instead of saying COVID-19, let's do low wagon data tracker, okay? I've changed this material, this, this content in my code here, and what I wanna do now is press this compile button. So it's gonna recompile my WeChat mini program to make it look what it should look like on the left here. And unfortunately, design doesn't look great, but you can see that as I change my code on the right, it then reflects in the simulator on my left. All right, so let's change this back to COVID-19 and then move on to the last part of our tour here, which is our debugger. So if I click on this button here, I can actually toggle these different elements. So I can close my simulator, I can open my simulator. Um, so we're gonna open up our debugger here. And so our debugger is where, if you've ever done uh, web development before in the past, this is gonna look very similar to the uh, Google Chrome dev tools. All right, you have a console where you can write JavaScript, or you also have sources, so you can see different files. You can see network requests, so requests that are going out and responses that are coming in. Um, you can see app data, a lot of really good information that we as developers use as we're building our WeChat mini program. So. Later on, we're gonna be discussing a little bit more in depth about what these different tabs in our dev tools is. Um, but for now, just know that this debugger is here. So that is gonna conclude our tour of the, uh, of the WeChat dev tools. Um, what I'd like you to do right now is your first action. So this is gonna be about five minutes where you're gonna be importing your own project into the dev tools. All right, so to do this, uh, if you open back up your, um, your workshop website here, um, you'll see action one, it walks you through every single step about how to open up your project. We wanna make sure that everybody has this project open so we can move forward, all right? So I'm gonna give everybody about five minutes now. I see that there's a lot of questions currently in the group about getting your own projects up and running. Let's make sure that everybody is good. If you already have your project imported, please give us a thumbs up in the group chat so we know you guys are okay. Um, about five minutes later, I'll come back and we'll get started on the next section, all right?
All right, guys. So um, I just wanted to uh, answer some questions that I'm having here on the group chat. Um, some people, the logo on the first page is taking some time to load. The reason is because that logo is being fetched from a foreign server outside of China. It might take a little longer than usual to load if it loads at all. The second is make sure that you guys have your sizing correctly. So if we go back to our, uh, if we go back to our simulator here, make sure that this whole page is within your simulator area. All right. Um, and I think basically I saw a lot of thumbs up. It seems like we all are on the same track. So let's keep going and dive a little bit into web languages. All right. So, um, a quick introduction to web languages. If you've done website development or web development before, then this is gonna be a review for you. Um, if you've never done before, then um, just gonna introduce you to these three coding languages here. The first is HTML, which I'm sure a lot of you have heard of. If you've ever dove into coding before, you've probably tried a little HTML yourself. So HTML provides the content or the structure of a website. So this is the links on a page, this is the words that you see, um, uh, this is the content, right? The second coding language that we have here is CSS. So CSS stands for Cascading Style Sheets. And what this does is it provides the design, the style to your website. So this helps position different elements on the page, it helps provide color to your content, background images, it helps to provide, uh, basically uh, is the, the style. It's, it's what makes your website look good. And then finally, we have a third coding language here called JavaScript. Now, uh, JavaScript is what makes websites generally more reactive or dynamic. So what that means is that as a user interacts with their website or your website, you can also have JavaScript interact with the user. So let's have an example. Say I click on a drop-down menu. Um, if it was HTML and CSS and I click on a drop-down menu, um, it generally won't work. But with JavaScript, if I click on that drop-down menu, a menu might pop over from the left or from the right. Or I might find that if I click on a button, that a pop-up appears on the website. Um, so again, JavaScript allows the website to interact with you. Um, another example of this is just simply Google. Um, if I look at Google search engine and I type words into the Google search bar, um, you'll see that Google is actually predicting what I want to search for. This is also using JavaScript. So JavaScript is very versatile um, and it's a very important language to learn as you're learning about not only web development but application development and, and now um, really about any kind of digital product development. So WeChat languages um, are, a, are a bit different but not very different. So, Basically what WeChat has done here is they've taken HTML and they've created their own coding language called WXML, which is uh, WX, Weixin, markup language. So instead of hypertext markup language, it's Weixin markup language. But the differences between WXML and HTML are, are very few, all right? So if you've ever done HTML before, then WXML is gonna be very easy to jump into. Secondly, we have WXSS instead of CSS. So again, same concept here. They've taken CSS and they've created their own coding language called Wasting Style Sheets instead of Cascading Style Sheets. Once again, this is basically a clone of CSS. There is very, very uh, limited differences between the two languages. Um, and if you've ever coded in CSS before, then going and coding in WXSS will be very easy. Um, and then finally, WeChat also uses JavaScript. Now they've developed their own uh, Weixin script language, but most developers today use JavaScript as the logic layer in their WeChat mini programs. So um, let's look at a uh, quick example of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript and where these are in our code. All right, so if we jump to our WeChat dev tools again, um, we can see that our files, so I'm gonna go number one, into this pages folder here. So if I click on this pages folder, it drops down two other folders. Now these two other folders 
um, are pages in my WeChat mini program. So I have a data page and I have an index page. What we're looking at on the left here, this is our index page. So I'm gonna open up our index page and I'm gonna see here I have four different files. I have a .js file, which means JavaScript. So I have a JavaScript file here. .json file, which is JSON formatted file. I have .wxml. So this is actually uh, similar to HTML, HTML file that we have here, WXML. And then we have our WXSS. So if you look at WXSS, this is actually very similar to CSS. Um, really no, no differences that you can see here on the page. So later on when you're customizing your WeChat mini program, you're gonna be using this WXML and WXSS to do it, okay? So, but tonight what we're gonna be doing is diving a bit more into JavaScript, okay? So let's dive into an introduction to JavaScript. All right, so what exactly is JavaScript? Um, I, I was looking on the web to try to find some good websites or some good tidbits of information that I could share with you guys about how to very precisely describe what JavaScript is. Um, and one of the best articles that I found was actually by the creators of JavaScript itself. So um, Mozilla was, well, one of the founders of Mozilla was one of the early writers of JavaScript, creators of JavaScript. And so if we go to their um, Mozilla Development Network web docs, they have a really good article explaining exactly what JavaScript is. And so what I wanna do is I wanna quickly take a tour of this website um, which you can of course read yourself and you can better understand what JavaScript is. Um, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna actually show you uh, exactly what the HTML on this page is, what the CSS on this page is, and then what also the JavaScript is. Okay, so first, um, we're looking at this website as a whole. Now this website is incorporating three different languages, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna remove the CSS from this page so you can see what it looks like with just HTML. Now, um, you might be looking at my screen and be like, what the hell did he just do? Uh, it, it's not magic or any kind of hacking. Uh, what I'm using, number one, is I'm using Google Chrome as my browser. And Google Chrome provides me with this inspect option here. And so what it allows me to do is I can inspect my website and understand exactly what are the components that are building this website in front of me, all right? So, um, this website is, is a very, uh, you know, it's very commonly built. So we all know that uh, if you are a website developer in the past, you know that the CSS for any website is located in the head of that website. So if I remove the head of this website, then I'm also gonna be removing the CSS. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna actually delete this part. And what you'll see is that my website now changes. So it changes to reflect only the HTML of this website. So again, I talked about how HTML is really just the content of the site itself. So you see there's a lot of words, there's a lot of links, there's a lot of images. Um, there are some dropdowns here, but mainly just links and words, all right? And images, that's right. So it's just the content of our page. If you've ever surfed the web back in the early 2000s, you probably saw a lot of websites that looked like this. Um, but what we have now for modern websites are, are much better looking, as I'm sure a lot of you know, um, encount encompassing all three languages, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. So again, let's, let's kind of take this as a, um, let's go back and let's see if we can actually add that each head back in. So we can't add it directly back in again, but we can refresh the page. And if I refresh the page, it'll then uh, reload with HTML, CSS, and everything in it. So you see here that I have HTML, CSS, and now the page looks much better. So the CSS, as we were talking about before, it provides the positioning, it provides the styling of my website. So you can see that the links now have a nicer color and it's positioned on the left. I have these nice button styles. Um, I have these nice dividing lines. I have really nice fonts. This is all CSS, is to make my website look good. Now, where does JavaScript come into play with all this? Let's try to identify some JavaScript on this page, all right? Um, 
Mm, so how about this? So this is JavaScript actually. If I here uh, wanted to search for something, I'd say um, date filter. As you can see, as I, as I click on this, I have a drop down on my screen. Um, and you have Game of Thrones, Array, Game of Thrones. I don't know why so many people are searching Game of Thrones here, but um, it seems that uh, as I am trying to search for something, JavaScript is identifying that I'm looking for something on this page, and it's creating this drop down so that I can then make a better choice. All right. Um, another way uh, that we can see some JavaScript on the page is by looking at, let's just say, this sign in, all right? Okay, so I just clicked the sign in button. And so what I'm doing now is I'm being led to github.com. And it's leading me to GitHub because it's using GitHub to log me in as a user. Um, now, GitHub, if you're not aware, is a site where developers will upload their code and store it in a cloud server so that my team members who are also working on the same code can, can also work on that code with me um, on different machines. So I have a username and password with GitHub and what the MDN web docs is doing is it's using JavaScript to call the GitHub login API, uh, which will then use my username and password to log me in. Okay, so again, this is JavaScript on our website. Um, so more more pertinent to our situation is we have two pages currently in our WeChat mini program. We have an index page and we have a data page, but we don't have any way of going from our index page to our data page. And there's no way to do that with WXML or WXSS. So we need to use JavaScript in order to move us from one page to another. All right, so the way that we do this is First, we open up our index.js file. Um, so I showed you a little bit about this before in the WeChat developers tools. Um, I open up this index.js file, which is the JavaScript file for my index page. And I'm gonna be then adding a navigation function into my JavaScript. So um, we built this template to make it very, very simple and very easy for you to just add code. So right where it says insert code here, I'm gonna be inserting a, a function, all right? So um, a function is comprised of a few different things. Number one, I have a function name. So if you look at this navigate to data, this is already the function name, all right? The second thing is here, I'm calling a local API, which is wx.navigate2. Inside of this API, I have one key, which is URL, and then the value of that key, which is pages data data and then I'm closing that, okay? So um, if you're a new developer, or if you're looking at this and be like, what am I looking at? Um, this is a WeChat's rendition of a JavaScript function. So uh, this wx.navigate2 is actually a function, a pre-built function that WeChat gives developers in order to navigate through the WeChat mini program. We were talking about this before, how WeChat's really easy to build because it provides developers with these pre-built functionality. Um, so this is just one of those functions. And how do we know what this is? Is because again of the WeChat developers tools. So if I open up this link, I can see here that I have documentation regarding this wx.navigate2. Um, and I can see here that one of the properties is URL um, and it's going to lead to the path of the page that I want to navigate to. Um, so this might seem a bit confusing at this point, but once we actually jump into the code itself, it'll look a little bit easier and feel a bit easier. So let's move on and, and, and go to the next step. Once we've added this function to our JavaScript file, the next thing we're going to want to do is we want to locate our WXML file, which is index.wxml. And in our index.wxml file, we want to add a bind tap to our button element. So um, on our WXML page, as you can see here, we have a button element at the bottom. Now this button element is the same button element that you see here on our simulator. 
Now, uh, how do I know that? Um, because it's a button element, as you can see on the bottom. Um, also, I'll show you a little trick later on to how to identify elements on your page. But also, we can see that the content is navigate to data. The content here is navigate to data. Okay, so on this button element, I want to add a bind tap. So what is a bind tap? Bind tap is an attribute that basically tells uh, WeChat mini program that if the user taps or clicks on this element, then I want you to call this JavaScript function. All right, so bind tap is equal to the JavaScript function that I want to call when this element is tapped. All right, so let's look at how this is done. I'll, I'll first walk through it with you guys just so you can easily, or just so you can see how I do it. And then I'm gonna give you a chance to do it yourself. All right, so I'm gonna open up my WeChat dev tools. And again, we're gonna see here that I have this navigate to data and I'm clicking it and nothing's happening. And it's because we don't have JavaScript yet on our page. So what we wanna do is here, we have this navigate to data function and I wanna insert my code here. So I'm gonna delete this insert to code and I'm gonna add our WX dot navigate to. And what you can actually see is that as I'm as I am typing in this WX local API, it actually even gives me some different suggestions as to what I should be building. And so what I might do uh, to make it a bit easier for myself and for you guys as well, is I'm just gonna press enter on this third one, navigate two, and this is the one we want. And you'll see that it automatically builds this small function for me. Um, and so it says URL is equal to URL. So what is this URL? This is a local path. Okay, so first thing I wanna do is I wanna have a backslash, which means my, this is the root of my directory. So if we look at our directory again, our directory is here, all right? Our root of our directory is this top level. And as we open up pages, think of this as going one level down, right? This is our second level, this data and index. Now, app.js, app.json, app.wxss, this is all still on our top level. This is not within a folder. But as we jump down into a folder, this can be seen as a second layer, and then finally a third layer, okay? So we have, what we wanna jump to is data, this data page here. So I'm gonna be doing this backslash pages slash data slash data. Because data is the folder, Pages is the folder that I want to go into. Data is the second folder that I want to go into. And then data here is the data file that I'm actually going to be um, going into itself. All right, so pages slash data slash data. And if I save that, now I have my navigation function. Um, so this function is currently in my JavaScript, which is great. And I'm clicking it, but it still doesn't work. So the next part is I need to add that bind tap to my WXML. So let's go back to our WXML and let's look here. Um, and again, uh, I showed you that I want to add it to this element here because it just makes sense. I have a navigate to data content there. It just tells people, tells the user to click me, right? So uh, what I wanna do here is I wanna add this bind tap to this element. Um, now, how do I know it's this element, that this piece of code here is this element? Well, again, I can just use my intuition and think, okay, well, this is a button element. Um, the second is I can see the content or a more scientific way of going about it is I can use my debugger. So if I open up my debugger and I click on this tool here on the far left, this is gonna allow me to then explore my page and see different elements. So you see here on the right, that this is the exact interpretation of my WXML up here, right? And so if I go down here and I scroll over this button, you'll see that my button element on the bottom right in the console is also highlighted, right? So now I know that this here, this button here, this element is the same as this button, okay? So I'm gonna add a bind tap. So I write bind tap is equal to, and then I put these quotation marks. Um, these quotation marks are, are necessary. You have to have the quotation marks. If you don't have the quotation marks, then you're most likely gonna get an error in your code, all right? So bind tap is equal to quotation marks. And again, here, I'm just gonna add the, the function name. So my function name is navigate to data, 
All right. So if I if I remove some of these spaces, it's a bit easier to see. But this is my entire function, navigate to data, which calls this mini API and then it allows me to navigate between pages. So I'm going to copy this navigate to data name and then add it into my bind tab. And then I'm going to press compile. All right, so now my page is compiled. Um, if I open up my debugger, my console, just in case, I want to make sure that there's no errors. And I'm going to now press this navigate to data button. And you'll see that it now navigates to my second page. OK, that's awesome. Um, some common problems that you guys might have is if I don't have these quotations around my bind tap, you're going to see an error here. All right, so make sure you have quotations around. If I don't spell navigate to data exactly like I have it in my index.js, I'm going to have a problem. So let's do that. Let's just do navigate to data. I do it all lowercase. Um, and let's see if this works. No, it says my error here, component pages index index does not have a method navigate to data to handle event tap, which means that there is no method or function called navigate to data. So if I look here, it's actually navigate to is capitalized and data is capitalized. So I have to go back and then I have to make sure that this is capitalized and this is capitalized. All right. Now another question that might come up is, okay, well, I put a bind tap on this button. Um, can I just tap everything now on the page and it works? No, not necessarily. You have to tap this element. All right. If I tap this element, then I can be navigated. Um, if I wanted to put this bind tap, say I copy this and I paste it somewhere else. Say for instance, I want to paste this into this image. I could do that as well. Um, and I would just press the image and then I could navigate to this other page. So again, it's, it's fully customizable in the way that I want. But just because of good design um, practice, I'm going to put it on the button. All right, so now that I've walked through this, I want to give you guys a shot at <coughs> trying it yourself. Um, I'll give you five minutes to create navigation between your index page and your data page. If you have any questions, please ask it in the group chat, all right? I'll be in the group chat to try to answer them as well as our TA Renee, all right? See you guys soon.
All right, guys, I'm going to try to answer some of your questions here on the webinar. All right. Uh, I'm looking at some questions that are popping up. Mm, okay, so uh, there was a good question regarding when to use Navigate 2 and when to use the Navigate tab on HTML. So let's actually look at this uh, and we can try both of them. So we have Navigate here, oh, Navigator. Actually, let's do this. Let's look at the dev tools. So again, we have our Navigate 2 page open up and then I also want to look up the uh, navigate. So it's going to be under components. It's going to be under navigators, functional page navigator and navigator. So this is a link to page. Um, so I have a target, I have a URL. Okay. So I have URL here and I'm going to do URL is equal to pages data data. And we can test this. So I have this using the navigator here and it also navigates. So um, again, there really is uh, no difference in terms of the functionality of choosing this navigator over the wx.navigate2. Um, however, if you're using this navigator, then you have to use this navigator element. So if you wanna use a button element and you wanna add navigation to that button, then you have to bind tap a JavaScript function to it. Um, another thing that I think might be um, a, a bit more deep, and if you want to jump into it, you can. Uh, it's also how you pass data. So um, Navigate 2 uh, allows you to open up what's called an event channel. Um, and if you want to search that on your uh, dev tools, feel free to do that. But it just basically gives you um, a bit more flexibility when you want to pass data from one page to the other. And also, uh, if you guys get your navigation working properly from the index page to the data page, then please send a thumbs up in the group chat so we know you guys are ready to move on. All right, so uh, it seems like we have a lot of people that have thrown a thumbs up into the group, so we're gonna keep moving forward. And if you are a little bit behind, that's no worries. You'll have time later on to complete this action. All right, so now we're gonna jump into about APIs. Um, so one of the things that we see currently on our page is we see a data page that has no real data. Um, this is a little bit outdated. You see on your page that you have a number of zeros that are currently in your national totals. But what we want to do is we want to add our, the current data, today's data regarding uh, even like the most up-to-date within the last 30 minutes, we want to add that data to our WeChat mini program so that when anybody opens it up now, that the data that they see is most recent. Because if they get a data that, you know, is yesterday or the day before, then it's not useful. All right, we want most, most real-time uh, data that we can possibly get. So how do we get this data? Um, this data generally comes from two sources. Number one, uh, well, actually, no, it really comes from APIs, which are application programming interfaces. Um, and, and APIs really dominate the, the web economy today. Um, we're going to jump a little bit into what APIs are in a second. But 
um, even if you have your own database. Say you have your own database with your own data, you still use an API in order to connect your front end to that back end. So APIs are not only third parties that provide APIs, but also um, your local development team also will generally use an API in order to connect your front end to your back end. So, so let's, let's talk about what these APIs are. Um, just as an example, let's look at this phone to our right here. Now this phone on our right um, is a WeChat mini program that's doing the same thing that, that we're trying to do. It's basically giving real-time data on what are the most up-to-date numbers regarding COVID-19. Um, and we can see that this is using a number of different APIs. Number one, it's using WeChat login API. So WeChat is providing the user's information to this WeChat mini program, um, and it's using the information to log them in. That is an API. Uh, it's using geolocation. As you can see on the top left of this phone, there is a Shenzhen there. If I click it, I can change to any location, but this will automatically appear. So it knows my location. And the reason why it knows my location is because WeChat provides them that information. Again, this is an API request. The second thing we have here are viral numbers data. So this is um, information regarding current confirmed cases, current deceased numbers, current um, recovered numbers, all this information regarding COVID-19, this doesn't just come from this application itself. This application generally does not have this information. This information comes from a, a source. So uh, for example, the source that we're going to be using today also is dxy.cn. All right. So this is an API tool that we can plug into to also get this information. Uh, and then another example will potentially be weather data. So WeChat many programs and WeChat many program developers don't know the weather every single city in China or around the world. Uh, what we do is we use APIs, we use these third party services to, to get that data from the third party and then bring it into our own application. All right? If this is still a bit confusing to you, it's going to make a bit more sense as we go on. Um, so again, as I was looking up, how do I possibly explain um, or even provide a metaphor for what an API is. Um, I really, I found this article, which I found was probably the best um, explanation of what an API is. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to read this. And as I read this, um, people can also click on this link and open it up and, and browse it as well. All right. So basically what an API is, according to Upwork, oh, I'm going to open back up my slides, is um, they do both a heavy lot of lifting in, in mobile and on the web today, all right? So they, they're responsible for nearly everything we do on our phones. And they allow you to do things like order a pizza through Olama, book a hotel through hotels.com or Ctrip, to rate a song. Um, this might be using iTunes or using NetEase, Wang Yue, or even to download software. Um, APIs, they generally work in the background of our applications in our phone. Um, but they make the interactivity that we expect on modern applications. Um, and so this is a good example that they provide is, is that if you're searching for a hotel room online, say you're on Ctrip um, and you're using the site's online form to select the city that you want to stay in, um, you're checking in dates and checking out dates, the number of guests that I have, um, the, the application itself, Ctrip, doesn't have all this information. For every single hotel that is listed under Ctrip, um, it doesn't have up-to-date information about what rooms are available and what rooms are not. So what happens is, is that as you click search, the site then sends multiple requests to an API or to these different hotels' APIs, which then respond with information regarding that hotel's um, room situation. Okay. So this all happens within mere seconds, even milliseconds. And so for a user, it seems instantaneous. As I search for a hotel, um, I don't know that that application is then making requests to other software applications around the world. Um, because it happens so fast, I just think that the application that I'm looking at has all the information there. But in reality, this application is, is very tied to um, a number of different software applications and different data streams that have their own data that they're then sending to this application C trip. All right. So um, a, a good 
image of this or a good illustration of this is, say you have a um, collation of assets. So in our example today, the asset is data. And the data that we want is the most, most up-to-date numbers of confirmed cases of NCOVID-19 um, and also you know, deaths, recovery rates, rate of change per day. This is all data that we want. And this data is aggregated by hospitals, by the local governments, by private companies. Um, this is very, very valuable data. So this data starts on the, on the right here. And so what these uh, companies or what these organizations that have this data do is they build APIs. And APIs, which is that middle illustration here, um, it allows developers to access this data, okay? And so we as developers on the far left with the nerdy glasses on um, are able to then access that data through this API. And then as we create our application, the end user is then able to see the application and see that data on their phone, all right? So APIs, if you're just a consumer and you've never developed an application before, you, you may have heard about APIs in passing, but APIs are not meant for the end user. APIs are really meant for developers. Um, and so for us and our purposes today, we're gonna be learning a bit more and diving into what, what these APIs are. So um, how does this work? So what we can actually do is we can give an example of this um, by copying this, this uh, here, which is a, uh, a request, a URL. So this actually looks a lot like a website URL, right? Um, so if I were to click on this, and I'm basically just making this URL, I'm, I'm sending a request in my browser. Um, and you'll see here the website that it pops up is just this data. It's a series of strings and objects and arrays uh, and values. And so what I can quickly come to realize is that um, this really is not meant for humans to consume. Um, this information, this website, is not meant for a typical user to go on and then understand exactly what data is being processed. And, and this is actually a very simple response. Some API responses are very, very large objects um, that take up entire pages and, and of course users would not be able to sift through all that data and, and make note of it themselves. So this right here is basically JSON. And this JSON is not meant for consumer consumption, but it's meant to be consumed by a machine, by an application. So what I just did there was I just made a request in my browser, and the response that I got was this. Now, generally, this is not how requests are made. Requests are not made in Google Chrome browsers or Safari browsers. They're made from my application. So say from my WeChat mini program or my iOS application or my website. And then the response that I get here is then read by my website, by my application, and then presented to me as a user on my screen in a nicer, more styled way that we're gonna be using a little bit later on today, okay? So um, what I have here is I have two ways of looking at this. I have the raw, so this is exactly how it looks. It's just a large string, and then I have parsed. So this is actually a Chrome extension that I have downloaded here. Um, it just changes the formatting of this JSON object to make it a bit more readable. Um, if you guys want to download it as well, I've included this Chrome uh, tool, this Chrome extension, down here on the left. Um, and again, it's not necessary, but if you want to, to call APIs in your browser just to see what the requests are uh, and to better understand the responses that you're getting from an API, then you can also download this as well, all right? So let's go back to our JSON here. So th again, this is the response. I have made my request by just simply um, typing this into my browser, into my uh, browser here. And the request you see here is this JSON. So what is JSON? Um, JSON is an object that has a key results uh, and this key success. So these two keys have their own values. This result has, uh, results has a value of all this data that I want here, all right? And so you can see that actually it's, it's real-time data about current confirmed counts 
which is 47,553. Confirm counts, expected count, all this really good data that we want as developers. All right, and then the success key has a value of true. And so this just means that the, the request or the response was accepted and the request was made successfully, okay? Um, so, so again, this result, the value of this result is all this great information that we're gonna want and need. Uh, and uh, this success here is just true. So how do I know about this API? Um, I think I have, Okay, uh, this API is coming from this website here, which is lab.isaaclin.cn slash ncov. Uh, and so what's good about this website is that it's, this is API documentation, which basically tells you how to utilize this API. So if you're a developer and, you, and you've ever worked with APIs before, or if you're a developer and you want to work with APIs in the future, then you have to become very comfortable at reading API documentation. It tells you how to request the API. Um, and so basically the first thing that this guy says is that uh, this is a free real-time infection data API, right? So this is exactly what we want. Uh, and the data source is Ding Xiang Yuan. So here is the dxy.cn website. So I can also get the API from here, but in order to do that, I have to jump through some registration hoops and to make it easier on everybody, we're just gonna use this third-party API um, today for our sources, okay? So um, if I scroll down, I can see some information regarding this API. Number one is that uh, the request API is this slash ncov slash API slash overall. And so what I'm doing here is this, I'm gonna see, okay, slash ncov slash API slash overall. Okay, so I'm adding that to my browser and I click and I can see that this is the response that I want, right? So this is how I get my data. And you can see that the, the parameters here that show up, um, it, it gives me a bit more information about what all this means. So if I go back, if I open this into another browser, so I say, open this here. Slash API slash overall. So I have my results in this tab and I have the documentation on the left. So um, first it says that um, there are some, so confirm count, current confirm count here increases the number of current remaining confirmed patients from yesterday. So current confirmed count. If we look at that, that's my top one. So 47553, if that number looks small, it's because it's the number of current patients today. Um, this is the, this is the uh, not the total aggregate count, but the number of confirmed count after people have recovered or people have potentially deceased, that number then decreases, all right? Um, so we can see here that this developer who created this API, they also provide us information about how this API works, okay? So, this is our API, and this is what we're using today in our WeChat mini program. So let's try this out in our own project. Not only can we request this API in our browser, but we can also do this from our WeChat mini program, all right? So the first thing we wanna do is that we want to uh, try this in our project by first going to pagesdatadata.js. Now this is this file underneath the data folder data.js, okay? So once we get there, <clears throat> we want to I'm sorry, it's not a navigation function. That was a mistake at a request. We are going to be adding an API request function, okay? So in that fetch data method function here, we are gonna be adding this bit of code. Now, wx.request is another local API that basically allows me to, like in my browser, request different APIs, or request, um, request different endpoints on the web. And so similar to wx.navigate2, I have a URL, but instead of that URL being a local path to my data page, that URL is the same link or the same URL that I put into my browser earlier on, which is that ncov slash api slash overall. Now, what you'll also see is underneath this URL, I have what's called a success. And so in here, I'm gonna have a function that is called after this URL is successfully requested. 
So what it does is it has this success function and it takes this res. Now what is this res? This res is the response that I get from my request. Now looking back at our browser, we saw that the response is this, right? So this is gonna be our res here. Now what I'm doing underneath of this in the success function is I'm calling console.log and in our parentheses here, I am also including this res. So this res can be seen as a variable. If you've ever done geometry in the past, um, I'm sorry, even you know, simple algebra, then you know what a variable is. It's basically a stand-in for a, for a number or for a series of numbers or even an equation. Um, here, this res is a variable for our response, okay? So console.log, this res, means that we're going to show this response in our console, all right? So um, once we've added this request function, and again, I'll show you how to do this in the code in just a little bit, but once we add this request function, we are going to add what, another bind tap. So just like we did before, we did a bind tap navigate to data. We wanna add a bind tap fetch data to our button in the, the data.wxml, which is going to be this button here. All right, so we're gonna be going to our WXML page, we're gonna be adding that bind tap, and then basically when the user clicks on this button, we want to call this fetch data JS function here. All right, so um, once we have created our JS function, once we've added our bind tap, and once we click on this fetch data button in our simulator, then we should see that request show up in our console. All right, so let's, let's take a look exactly about how this all works in our dev tools. So once again, I already have my navigation between button and data, so I can just click this and it's gonna lead me to my data page. Great. Now, if I click on this fetch data now, nothing happens. And the reason why is because I haven't done anything yet. All right, it's not magic. So let's go to our, again, I'm under pages, and I go to my data folder, and then I wanna to go to data.js. And the first thing I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna insert my code in fetch data. <clears throat> so here I'm gonna do wx.request, and again, you can see that WeChat mini programs is suggesting um, a number of different local or native functions that I can use. So I'm just gonna press enter here, and it's gonna present me with this URL that I can change. So I'm gonna go back to my browser, copy this URL, paste it in here, and that looks good. <clears throat> now after I copy this, paste it in, I'm going to add a comma which is going to separate this line, this URL line, with the next line, which is success. So success here, I'm gonna have called function, um, res, oh, sorry about that. Uh, I'm actually not gonna add function, I'm gonna use what's called a uh, an arrow function here. So it's gonna look a little bit different, but it's gonna solve the same purpose. So I have success, I have a colon, and then I have this res. Again, this is gonna be my variable for the response that I'm getting from this request. Then I have this arrow, which is just an equal sign, right? It's an equal sign, and then an arrow right. After that, I'm gonna create this um, curly brackets. So if you've never uh, used this curly brackets before, if you hold shift and you look next to your P key, it's gonna be right there on the right. All right, I'm gonna open it up, and here I'm gonna write console.log res. So what this is saying, again, is that sending a request to this URL, and then on the success of that request being made, I want to console log the result, which is this res variable here. Right, so I'm gonna save this data.js, and I'm gonna go now, uh, let's go back, navigate to data, let's see, did that work? Is it in my console? No, and the reason why is because we haven't yet added a bind tap to our WXML. If we tap this, our fetch data function here has not been called yet. So we wanna go to data.wxml, 
And in our data.wxml, we're going to scroll to the bottom and find that button element again. So um, once again, I can either scroll to the bottom and find this button element because it's a button element, or what I could do is I could open my debugger and I can click on this uh, element inspector uh, icon here. And I can scroll over my page and I can see that this fetch data button is here at the bottom of my WXML. So this same element. And what I want to do is I want to add that bind tap is equal to then the name of my function. So the name of my function is fetch data. So I'm going to add this right here. I'm going to save. All right. So once again, navigate to data. Now I'm on my data page here and I'm going to fetch my data. And you can see here that I have a couple new lines that just opened up. The one here that we are most interested in is this is our response. So if I look in here, I open it up, I can see my data results and I open this up and I see that this is all the data that I wanted. This is the exact same as we have here. All right, so perfect. This is exactly what I want. Now the data is in my WeChat mini program. Um, it's still not on my page, but we're gonna be focusing on that next, all right? So for now, what I want you guys to do is following along again with our build a WeChat mini program notes here, we want you to add your own API request to your project, okay? Uh, once again, I'll be in the group chat. If you have any questions for me, just ask me in the group chat. Uh, in about five minutes, we're gonna come back and we're gonna move to the next action. All right, which is gonna be binding that data to our page. But first, based on what we just learned, let's add our own API request to our project. All right, so I'll give you guys five minutes. If you have any questions, please ask in the group. Talk to you soon. Uh, one of the things that I want to note really quick, uh, and we mentioned this also in the website here, but um, WeChat, what they do is they also want to make sure that the APIs that you're calling are in line with their um, terms and conditions. So if you're publishing your WeChat mini program, you need to basically, um, you need to uh, submit these API domain names to Tencent for verification. However, uh, because we're just testing them today, uh, we don't need to do this. Uh, instead, what we can do is we can click on this little arrow button and we wanna go on to details. It might be a button for you here on the right, it might not, but we only click details. So once I open up details, I can look at these, I have three tabs on the top. I wanna click on local settings. 
And in my local settings, I have here checked, does not verify valid domain names, web view, TSL versions, and HTTPS certificates. So um, by default, this is unchecked, all right? And so what's gonna happen is if I try to call this API, you're gonna see I have an error popping up. So this error basically says that uh, this API domain name is not within my whitelisted domain names. So what I need to do is I need to tell We Chat Many Programs that just ignore that, I'm just testing right now, you don't need to val uh, verify that. So I'm gonna click that box, it's gonna restart my We Chat Many Program, and as I go through that process once again, I navigate the data, and I fetch my data, you'll see that it now works, okay? Um, another question that I, I, I can imagine is gonna pop up as well is that um, if your navigation to data button does not work or you did not get that in the last step, another thing you can do is you can change your compilation. So right now it's on ordinary compilation, which means that it's going to, uh, every time you compile your or save your WeChat mini program, it's going to present to you the index page or the first page. What we want to tell it to do is, okay, instead of doing that, we want to add a compilation where um, the startup page is not pages index, but it's pages data data. Now I'm going to call this my data compilation, okay? And then I'm going to press OK here. And now that I've created this new data compilation, it immediately loads onto my data page. So I don't have to go through that process of navigating to my data page from that index page, all right? It could make your lives a lot easier. Um, and just save you a little bit of time. So go ahead and do that, and later on, if you want, just go back to ordinary compilation, and you can do it from the start. All right, uh, I'm gonna give you guys about two more minutes. If you've already got your API request coming in, and it's in your console, please give me a thumbs up in the group chat. Um, if you have any questions, please also send us a screenshot of your entire screen, all right? If you just show us the error message, we don't know exactly where your error is happening or how to fix it. So we need to make sure that we see everything here, mainly including your code, all right, where the error, has, where the error is occurring. Um, all right, give you guys another two minutes here to, to finish up, and then we'll move forward to actually binding this data to our page. Um, so T-O-I-N-E, you had a question, uh, you had an error that's popping up, which actually I think it might be a pretty common error. Um, so what we'll do is we can take a look at what this error is. Ooh, my WeChat developers tools are bugging out. Let's do this. Let's close it down and open back up. All right, so recompiled, looks good. I'm gonna open up my data.js. And so one of the problems that I saw earlier was that um, it, there was an error saying that on load wasn't working or for some reason. And the reason why is most likely because this comma was missing for some reason. So if I try to save now, you'll see that I also get an error in my console, Hold on. I'm debugging, I'll move forward. One second. Okay, let's see if we can get over this debugger here. Okay, here we go, yeah, unexpected token. So um, this is a very common error. What I have to do is just add this comma, and if I add this comma to my fetch data at the end there, it should then work, all right? So try that out. Um, great, if you add the comma, it works, looks good. If you guys have a proper request and response going into your console, please send a thumbs up so we know it looks good. If you guys are completely lost, send a, um, a, a help me emoji.
all right? And then we'll also try to backtrack a little bit and maybe help out some people who are left behind. All right, so thank you guys. Uh, we're gonna come back in just one minute. All right, so we're going to move forward now to data binding. All right, it seems like most people have gotten um, a request made, and so we want to make sure that we're continuing moving forward, we get everything in. Um, so talking about data binding, so what is data binding? Data binding is how our JavaScript uh, sends information to our view. So as we saw earlier with a couple different mini program uh, examples, we saw that there was a bunch of information being shown to the users on their screen. And so we want to do the same thing. We want to take the response that we currently have in our console um, and in our JavaScript file, and we want to put that on our WXML. Um, and so the way that we can do that is by placing these data into our page data object, okay? So um, as you can see here in my data, I have confirmed 900, cured 100, and that same information also shows up on my view. We'll give an example of this in just a little bit. But how does this work? Um, it works with what's called mustache syntax. Uh, and now, where does that word come from? As you can see, uh, if un in the red square here, um, around confirmed, you have these double curly braces. And these double curly braces these double curly braces are indicating that whatever content is in these double curly braces um, is considered to be JavaScript, really. Um, and even more specific for our circumstance, it is a JavaScript key that is in our page data. Okay, so if we go back, we had here, we have data, and we have a confirmed key, and we have a cured key. The value of our confirmed key is 900 the value of our cured key is 100. So here we have confirmed. So this is data.confirmed really here. And also underneath of this, we have cured. So this is gonna be 900, 100. Same thing, 900, 100, all right? So um, another way that we can look at this is by um, looking currently at our data, we have this test key and value of hello world. So what I want to do is I'm going to actually use that data compilation just to make it a bit easier. I want to add this hello world um, instead of our national totals here. So right now I want to find this national totals, which I have right here. And I'm going to change this by removing that. And I'm going to be adding my curly, um, my mustache syntax. So again, it's just double curly braces on either side. And then in the middle, I want to add my key, which is test. So I'm gonna add test here. And this national totals should change to hello world, great. So now what I can do is I can change this hello world to um, hello from Wagon Shenzhen. And you'll see that also on my page, it changes just as well. I haven't changed anything in my WXML, it's still test. But as I can change things in my JavaScript, it then reflects in my WXML here. So again, it's, it's very powerful in that way. Um, so what we want to do now is we want to take this result that we have here 
and we want to move this to our data here in a like a key of results. Okay, so uh, let's find out how to do that. So first, what we want to do is we want to modify our our function a little bit. Um, the first thing we do is we remove that console.log. Actually, let's not remove it yet, but we want to change our console.log in a couple different ways. Number one is we want to set a variable. So um, again, if you've ever done uh, algebra before, you know that a variable is a stand-in for a value. The value in our circumstance is going to be our data. Um, so here we have this variable that we're going to be declaring with let. So let results, which basically means I'm making a variable called results equal to, and then this is going to be our object. So res, which again is our variable here, dot data dot results, and then this. So um, if you've ever learned JavaScript before, then you know this is a way of identifying keys and uh, keys and values within an object. And also this is a way of identifying a value within an array. But if you're new to JavaScript, we don't have time enough to go over all of this. So really just take this line of code from the website and paste it into your own JavaScript function. But from a 5,000 foot view, what this is doing is this is going into that data object, looking at that data key and that value, um, then looking at that results key in the data value, and then finding that first uh, zero. So if, if I look at this from my code here, in my debugger, I fetch my data, I get it in my console, and I open, I'm gonna make this a bit bigger so you can all see, I open up this data here, and you can see that I have res. This is my res, right? Res.data, so this is data, dot results, and then in uh, our brackets, we have zero. So it's the first entry in this array. And so this is the data that we want, okay? This is the data that we want. So this uh, right here, res.data.results, this is gonna be this here, all right? This entire object. So just know that this results variable is going to be this final object here. Second thing we're gonna do is we're gonna be setting this variable to our page data object. So again, what we, what we had earlier, the problem that we have is that we need to move our data from here to here. Now we can't just you know, drag and drop, unfortunately, but what we can do is use something that's called this.setData. So setData is a method or a function, again, that WeChat provides us that allows us to add new data variables to our page data, which then we can use in our user interface. Right? So we take our results variable and we add it to the this.setData. Um, and notice that this.setData is, is made up of a couple of different things. Number one is this.setData and then it has parentheses and within that parentheses it has curly brackets. And then in that curly brackets it's our results variable. Okay, so we're gonna modify our function and again I'll show you this live in a little bit. Once we modify our function, then we're gonna add our mustache syntax to our WXML, okay? So looking at our WXML, um, we have our results key, which is gonna be in our data, and then we're gonna do that results dot whatever the value is that we want to display at that, at that moment. So we can see here that I'm trying to con uh, convey to the user that this is the number of confirmed cases of COVID-19. Now, here I'm going to be doing results.currentConfirmed count, which is the number of current confirmed cases, then results.cured count, then results.dead count, then results.currentConfirmed increase, so which is the rate of change. Um, so I'm going to be using, adding the mustache syntax to all of my different uh, uh, layers of my WXML. All right, so let's look at how this works. So again, here um, I'm looking at my console and I see my data is in my res, which is this larger object here. Again, how do I know that? Because I console logged this res variable. So console log means that I'm gonna console log whatever I put in, in, in between these parentheses. So if I'm putting my, my response in between these parentheses, then what I see here is my response. 
So I want to just do let results is equal to res oh, res dot data dot data and then if I open up in data there's results dot results and the results is not an object like cookie or like, like data or res results is an array so what we need to do is in order to indicate this we need to do a bracket and then zero which is indicating the first indices of this array all right so res dot data dot results so then this results if I want to just console log this results variable now let's see if this works so fetch data and then here I have an object now that has all of my data that I want perfect so what I want to do now is I'm going to do this dot set data and again what I did here is I said this dot set data and I can also look at what WeChat is providing me. It's providing me this method set data. Um, and then I have parentheses after this. And then in between these parentheses, I'm going to add our curly brackets. And I'm going to add this results, which is our variable here. Okay? So um, once I've done that, we'll now see what happens. I click fetch data, and it's no longer appearing in my console. And why is that? Because I removed the console log. So how do I know that my data is going to be in this page object? Um, and the reason why I know this is because if I look at my tabs here, I can see app data. And I can see on my pages data data, I have my test, hello from the wagon Shenzhen. I also have this results here. And if I open up results, I can see that I have all the data that I just added to it from this response, this request and response. All right. So. What I can do now is I can change my WXML to, um, to mirror this data, all right? So we're going to close my debugger, we're gonna open up my data.wxml, and we're gonna look at this. So first of all, I'm gonna change this to uh, global numbers. And under confirmed, here, I'm gonna add my mustache syntax, which is just, again, two curly brackets around each other. And the first thing I'm going to say is results. Because again, results, if I look at my debugger, is the, oh, I'm sorry, I have to fetch data. Here we go. Results is the name of my object. And in that object, I have a number of these different keys and values. So I want confirmed, so current confirm count, or maybe I want total confirm count. So I'll just do confirmed. So confirm count. And then I'll go to cured cases here. Same thing, adding my mustache syntax, results dot cured count. And again, I need to do it exactly like it is here. Um, so that means that the first cured is lowercase and the last count is uppercase. So finally here, deceased, I want to put dead count. So I'll actually add that here. And then rate of change, which is current confirmed increase, which is negative 2357, which means that the number of confirmed cases has decreased from yesterday by 2,357. Um, so I'll do results, oh, results dot current confirmed route. And it looks like I actually missed this one as well. Results dot dead count. Okay, and then finally updated on, we have last one here, adding our mustache syntax, results dot and it looks like it is update time, results.update time. And I'm gonna save, and let's see how this went. I just added this WXML. I have gonna press my fetch data, and I have my real-time numbers now. Great, so I have my data that is being requested from an API, which is being then a response with that data I'm adding that to my page data and then I'm then showing it on my WXML. So this is my real-time data tracking WeChat mini program. It's very simple, but um, it is doing exactly that. All right, so uh, this is a bit more of a complicated action. So 
I want to make sure that you guys have enough time to make sure that you guys do it and do it correctly. I'll also be in the group chat if you have any questions regarding this. Um, what we want to do, again, is to set our data to our page data, and then we want to change the WXML to include mustache syntax, all right? So I'm gonna give you guys another five minutes. After this five minutes is up, we'll come back and we'll talk a bit more about moving forward, what's next, all right? So uh, I'll see you guys all in the group chat in just a minute. Hey guys, I'm seeing a lot of good stuff in the group chat already. Um, if you have successfully uh, sent the request and then displayed the information on your own page, then quickly send us a screenshot of your desktop. I wanna see how it looks, and if you don't wanna do that, you just wanna send a thumbs up, that works too, all right? All right, so it doesn't seem like there are many questions currently in the group chat. Um, so what I'm gonna do now is we're gonna move forward and kind of talk about what is next for our WeChat mini program. Um, and the first thing that I wanna show you guys is that you can actually preview your WeChat mini program on your own phone. And the way you do that is within your WeChat dev tools, um, you can click on this button called Remote Debug. And what it's gonna do is it's gonna, um, up, it's going to create a QR code which will then use your phone, WeChat, to scan. Um, and once you've scanned that, then your WeChat mini program should show up on your phone and you should be able to navigate and you should be able to fetch your data as you would on your WeChat dev tools. So uh, it's a really cool way of being able to this, um, look at your WeChat mini program on your phone, screenshot it, share it with your friends, uh, and a good way of also showing us how you're progressing, all right? Um, Second thing is, and I don't have a, um, a I don't have a slide here about it, <clears throat> but there is some ice bucket things that I want you guys to to look at. So the the first thing in the ice box. So ice box is basically here are some functions or things that you can do after this workshop to continue building upon your WeChat Mini program. Um, and the first thing, of course, is to customize your project's design. All right. So if you look at your index dot, uh, if you go back to our ordinary compilation and you look at your pages index, index.wxss, um, we have a number of keys and values here as well that you can change. So for instance, I made the background this dark gray color, but say you wanna make it a, a red, um, then you can do that. Of course, this is gonna need a little bit of CSS. That's not a great look. You're gonna need a little bit of CSS to make this work, um, CSS understanding to make this work. But if you have a little bit of CSS and it's really not difficult to learn, then you can customize this, all right? This is also the URL of the logo that we're using here. You can also change that. You can change the font color, whatever you want to make it customized to yourself. 
Um, the second thing is, is you can change the WXML content as well. Um, and to do that, you would go to your index.wxml and change any of these, any of this content you see here. All right. So um, again, this is something for you to do after the workshop. Um, another one is, and we're going to continue adding on to this, but another one is that you can make um, some updated, uh, so currently, as you can see in your page, if I fetch this data, my updated on here is this long number. <clears throat> and a lot of people have been asking in the group, like, what is this number? This is actually UTC. And so what it is, is it's actually the number of milliseconds from January 1st, 1970. Um, so it's, it's a way that machines tell time. And so each machine around the world has just come up with an idea, or oh, not machines, but computer scientists, that we're just gonna count number of milliseconds from this specific date. And so what you can do is you can actually use JavaScript to change this number to a more readable number, like today's date, which is February 25th, 2020. All right, so again, this is in the ice box. If you wanna continue moving forward, I have a couple other things in mind that I want to add to this. So I'm gonna continue adding over the next couple of days. And so you guys can also continue building on your own WeChat Mini programs. But um, these are just a few things that you can chew on uh, over the next few hours if you wanna keep building, over the next couple of days if you wanna come back later on. All right, um, so other things are, if you guys are interested in WeChat Mini programs in general, um, or if you see a nice business opportunity for yourself to build a WeChat mini program to give to your clients, um, you don't actually need to build a custom mini program for that use case. There are a lot of great generators or templates that are currently on the market, which do um, a lot of things that 90% of WeChat mini programs can do. So Yozan, Shangxianle, um, they're all really great templating engines and generators to build um, e-commerce stores for your WeChat mini program. Uh, also, there is an entire ecosystem around WeChat Mini programs. There's blogs, there's generators, there's forums. We talked a little bit about MinApp today. Uh, if you're interested in uh, understanding more about this ecosystem, you can scan this QR code. We'll provide a PDF uh, with links to all these different um, uh, organizations and websites. Uh, and then finally, uh, talking more about the wagon ourselves. Um, if you really want to dive more deeply into understanding code and technology, uh, we provide an outlet to be able to do that. Through our programs, we've taught multitudes of alumni to change their life from potentially a career in marketing or in sales to a career more focused on tech and understanding how tech is shaping our world today. Um, and we do that through our full-time programs, our part-time programs, um, as well as our programs around the country. We have locations not only in Shenzhen, but also in Shanghai and Chengdu. So if you're interested in continuing to learn with the wagon, either through one of our programs or through a number of our free workshops or a number of our articles that we send out or just want to join the community of developers that we are, then feel free to join our official account. Um, we send a lot of great information regarding tech in China as well as from our local hubs in Shanghai, Chengdu, and Shenzhen.